This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this distinguished lecture by Professor Irwin Kotler. It's a great privilege to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you especially for braving the uh, traffic in Atlanta on this uh, unusually rainy evening. Uh, my name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University, the host of this evening's proceedings. And we're proud to be co-sponsoring this evening's lecture with our friends from the Atlanta Jewish Times and from the Emory Center for International and Comparative Law, directed by my colleague, Professor Abdullahi Annaim. Our Law and Religion Center is dedicated to studying the legal dimensions of religion, the religious dimensions of law, the interaction of legal and religious ideas, institutions, methods, and practices. Working with some 90 faculty from around the Emory campus and some 1,600 scholars from around the world, our center sponsors advanced research projects and publications, senior fellowships, specialized courses, degree programs, clinical internships, and various public conferences, lectures, and forums such as this one this evening. This evening's lecture is part of the Center's new lecture series entitled, When Law and Religion Meet. And the series brings to the, the lectern distinguished religious and political leaders from various parts of the world to discuss how state law challenges their religious communities and how their religious communities in turn challenge state law. In this lecture series, we are confronting some of the hardest legal, political, and moral questions of our day. Questions of life and death, of war and terror, of faith and freedom, of religion and state, of marriage and family, and more. And we are summoning some of the deepest wisdom of our religious traditions in hopes of finding new ways to think about our lives together as persons and peoples, as citizens and believers, as consumers and stewards of what we have been given. These next two weeks, we are privileged to welcome to this lectern leaders of the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian worlds to grace us with their thoughts from their perspectives. Next year, we hope to host leaders from the Hindu, Buddhist, and Native American worlds as well to continue the conversation. Tonight's lecture is the inaugural Harold J. Berman Lecture, dedicated to the memory of our late great friend and colleague and teacher, Harold J. Berman. One of the most distinguished legal polymaths of the 20th century, Professor Berman was a ranking authority on Russian law, international and comparative law, legal history, jurisprudence, and law and religion. Author of some 25 books and 500 articles, he served as James Barr Ames Professor of Law at Harvard Law School from 1948 to 1985. And in 1985, he joined the Emory community as the Robert W. Woodruff Professor of Law and Senior Fellow in Law and Religion in our Law and Religion Center, serving in those capacities till his death in November 2007. This Harold J. Berman lectureship was made possible by the generous support of several of his Emory colleagues and students and family members. And I want to say a special word of appreciation and admiration for the generosity of the Berman family, of his beloved widow Ruth, and of his daughter Jean Berman and her husband Eric Press. Jean Berman uh, was kind enough to fly in from Moscow and New York and wherever else she had been over the last week to join us this evening and to represent the family. We want to express our deepest appreciation to Eugene for all that you have done, for the stewardship that you have shown in the creation of this wonderful lectureship and for the wonderful representation of the family that you have this evening. We love having you here. We Miss Dear Ruth, who is 92 years old and gallivanting about in Brazil, um, but we send warm greetings to her, send our love to her, and please thank, thank, accept our thanks for your wonderful generosity. Maybe I can ask you to stand and express our appreciation. She's 93. 93, I'm sorry and gallivanting still in Brazil, no doubt. <laughs> I've been privileged to plan this evening's lecture with my distinguished friend and colleague, uh, Michael J. Broyd. Uh, professor Broyd is the professor of law and senior fellow in law and religion at Emory University. He is one of the world's leading scholars of Jewish law. 
Uh, he will serve as the chair of our proceedings this evening and will introduce our speaker and will monitor the Q&A with you after a distinguished lecture. Will you please join me in welcoming Professor Broyd, who will introduce Professor Kotler. Professor Cutler is called in Canada Counsel for the Oppressed, and that alone is a magnificent introduction. The Jewish tradition teaches us that caring for the downtrodden, the weak, and the oppressed is a central mission for all of us and for each and every one of us. It's sometimes easily overlooked. It's something that we frequently turn our eyes away from, sometimes out of a sense of hopelessness, sometimes because we think we have more important things to do. But when one encounters a person who spends his life tirelessly working for righteousness, to right the plight of those who are oppressed, one can only listen with a great deal of attention. And this is a person who has built a stellar resume not just as a counsel for the oppressed, but as a law professor, a professor at McGill, a visiting professor at Harvard, has visited many an esteemed law school and produced a collection of scholarship that would make any law professor envious. And then he has another career. He's a member of the Canadian Parliament, served as what we would call Attorney General for a number of years, and now he is, so to speak, the Attorney General in opposition, um, and has led a career as a member of parliament elected by um, the single largest majority in unprecedented activity more than a decade ago, and he's led an esteemed life as a politician. Um, it's important to realize that we sometimes encounter people who seem to have the whole package. Um, they do the right thing, they succeed professionally, and they go on to enormous accomplishment in the broader world around them as leaders of general society. Our speaker today is a model of what we all aspire to be, somebody who seeks to do righteousness, justice, everywhere, all the time, and has done so while building an illustrious career in two distinctly different fields, first as a law professor, and then as a successful, active, moral, and just politician in Canada. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Erwin Cutler to speak to us this evening. Michael, thank you for those uh, very uh, kind words of, of introduction for uh, which people will forgive you as they uh, are an act of, of uh, friendship but as some say, you know, uh, may the good Lord forgive you for saying some of those things and me for believing them. But uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, share with you what my son would have said had he introduced me because uh, he requires me to offer this repast in case I ever get what he would regard uh, as an overly uh, generous and inappropriate uh, introduction. But in order to share this with you, I have to make full disclosure at the outset. I happen to be uh, technically illiterate, or to use a politically correct term, technically challenged. Regrettably, I don't know how emails work, uh, computers, uh, video, and, and the like. In fact, I, I suspect I could not even have gotten an entry job into the Department of Justice uh, today. Well, my son, who's now 22, but when he was three years of age, he had a prescient sense that I didn't know how any of these things worked. And he came to me one day with that impish grin, which uh, uh, emerged as his trademark, and he looked up at, to me and he said, Daddy, can you help me fix the video? And I said, well, Yoni, I don't know how to fix the video. And he looked up to me again and he said, I know, Daddy. All I'm asking you to do is to pick me up because I can't reach it. <laughs> where, where, whereupon, later in the day, my daughter came to me and said, uh, uh, Daddy, do you know what Yoni told me? And I said, no. He said, Gila, Daddy may be a nice man, but he's not very smart. He's not very smart. So this, uh, Michael, thank you again for those very kind words of introduction. Uh, but uh, this is the, as I say, repast that he would have offered. I, I have a humbling experience in my home from my 
four children at any given moment in time. I'll just leave it with one of his more recent uh, comments when he said to me, Dad, you know, if you ever get Alzheimer's, we'll never know. There'll be no difference. And so uh, th this is the kinds of things I'm exposed to uh, on a regular basis in the humbling presence of my uh, children. I am delighted to be able uh, to be here to return to uh, Emory Law School uh, to be part of a the work of this great law school and the great the center for law and study of religion. This is really a world-class initiative, world-class in its interreligious dimension, in its interdisciplinary inquiry, in its international reach, and all under the inspired uh, leadership of John uh, Woody, who I suspect will be writing a book before I complete my lecture this evening. Uh, I, I've been astonished at his, you know, prolific output. Uh, it really belies uh, any uh, comparison, and he has been really not only a uh, prolific uh, scholar, not only an exemplary head for the uh, Center for the Study of Law and Religion, but he has been an international uh, academic leader and, and public uh, intellectual and a real inspiration to all of us uh, wherever uh, we may be. And so it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to be part of, even in this limited way, a community that is dedicated around uh, the concepts of, of freedom, uh, the concepts of uh, liberty, uh, and, and the concepts of uh, family and faith. Uh, that sense in which uh, Emory University and the center is dedicated to these uh, principles of freedom and faith and family, which, as uh, Emory itself has said, not only touch us all so profoundly in our daily life, but in respect of which uh, people are prepared to <coughs> sacrifice themselves for these uh, values as being the ultimate values that determine uh, who we are and what we aspire to be. And in that context as well, it's a privilege to be able to, uh, to be here to inaugurate the Harold Berman uh, Lectureship. Uh, I say this not only because of Harold Berman's incomparable in uh, leadership as a you know, comparative scholar of religion and culture and the law, and here too, uh, having achieved international resonance in each and all of these things, and because he served as a constant reminder uh, to us to ground ourselves uh, in uh, the common spiritual values, to ground ourselves in that common uh, heritage and in that which is uh, foundational for our uh, shared uh, destiny. And I first met, I had known of, of Harold Berman, as uh, we all knew of him uh, through his works. Uh, through his great works, and I was, as everyone in this room would be, a beneficiary uh, of those works. But I met him, you know, at, at Harvard Law School during the 1983-84, as I was telling his, his daughter over uh, dinner this evening, was my first opportunity to actually uh, meet with him uh, personally, and I was struck, struck by the uh, humility, you know, of this uh, great man. I was struck by the breadth and depth of wisdom, which sometimes could sound as a, a cliché, uh, but which emanated from him uh, in all he said and, and wrote. And it was a privilege uh, that year as it happened. Uh, Michael, you mentioned, uh, re referenced my work with Prisoners of Conscience. It was that year that I was almost at the height of my involvement with what were then a Soviet uh, Prisoners of Conscience. And I looked to Harold Berman not only uh, for an understanding of the law in general, but for a particular appreciation at that time of Soviet law in particular, and sought to ground my representations uh, to the then Soviet Union in Soviet law, not in American law, not in uh, Canadian law, but in the basic principles of Soviet law, because I shared with Harold Berman, which uh, some might have been skeptical of at the time, that the Soviet Union, and in terms of uh, law on the books, you know, had an exemplary legal system. If you could, however, show that law in action made a mockery 
of law on the books at a time when the Soviet Union was preoccupied with law and legitimacy, then this was the best way to engage uh, the former uh, Soviet Union on behalf of political prisoners. But it was Harold Berman uh, that offered me that kind of insight and understanding and helped in uh, those legal briefs uh, with respect to which we were able to join issue with the uh, former uh, Soviet Union. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, this evening to participate in the common cause uh, which brings us together, what I would call the struggle against hate, against injustice, against indifference to that injustice, and against the crime whose name we should even shudder to mention, namely a genocide. And all this is part of the larger struggle, part of the larger struggle for human rights and human dignity, for international uh, justice and peace, for those common foundational values of which Harold Berman spoke and wrote about so eloquently and so uh, compellingly. And as it happens, we meet at an important moment of remembrance and reminder, because we meet in the aftermath of the 60th anniversary of the Genocide Convention, the Never Again Convention, as it has sometimes been called, but which has been violated tragically again and again. 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which here too has been violated repeatedly in each of its uh, particulars. And so, as uh, Kierkegaard has, has put it, uh, while life must be lived forwards, sometimes it can only be understood uh, backwards. And so the question that I put to us uh, this evening in a kind of retrospective with respect to the uh, Genocide uh, Convention in, in particular. What is it that we have learned and what is it that we must do? I'm going to share with you uh, three lessons this evening uh, using uh, Ahmadinejad's Iran as a, a case study. The three lessons are, number one, the danger of state-sanctioned incitement to genocide. I'm not talking about the dissemination and the willful promotion of hatred and contempt, as it's called, in a uh, constitutional uh, a democracy, in a uh, liberal uh, democracy, and whether or not you know, hate speech should or should not be protected speech. Those are arguments about which you know, scholars and practitioners uh, can and do debate. I'm talking about a particular phenomenon of state-sanctioned incitement, and not just to hate, but to uh, the uh, sometimes put the mother of all crimes, uh, namely a uh, genocide. So that's the first lesson of which, as I say, Ahmadinejad's Iran will form a uh, backdrop and, and context. Uh, the second is the danger of indifference and inaction in the face of international uh, atrocity, in the face also at this point of incitement uh, to uh, a, a genocide. And the third, a culture of impunity that has attended the first two. And here, if I may depart for a moment with respect to uh, Iran, because we're also on the eve of the 15th anniversary of the Rwandan uh, genocide, a genocide whose horror lies not only in the genocide, but in the fact that this genocide was preventable. Nobody can say that we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as nobody can say with respect to Darfur that we did not know or do not know what is happening. We knew and know, but we have not been acting. And even as we meet, uh, as I say, next month is the 15th anniversary of uh, the genocide in, in Rwanda and in Canada, we adopted a motion to set aside April 7th as a national day of reflection on the prevention of genocide, to learn the lessons of the Rwandan genocide, which are not unlike that which will be my case study this evening. The dangers there too of state-sanctioned incitement to genocide. The danger there too of indifference and inaction in the face of that incitement and the culture of impunity uh, that attended it. And that holds true as well for Darfur. 
because as we meet, over 400,000 have already died in this uh, genocide uh, by uh, attrition. More than 2.7 million have been internally uh, displaced. Some 4 million are in desperate need of uh, humanitarian assistance. Indeed, I would say that the uh, humanitarian assistance system is itself on life support. The whole betraying the lessons of, of history, which I've been uh, referencing, and betraying also the responsibility to protect doctrine, uh, which we uh, affirmed at, uh, through the United Nations uh, Security Council as well three years ago, that whenever, whenever we are in the face of mass atrocity, war crimes, crimes against humanity, a genocide, and a state is unable or unwilling to act, or as in the case of uh, Sudan, is the author of that criminality, then there is an international responsibility to protect, whose first constituent is really the responsibility to prevent. And that did not come about, although Canada speaks of itself as being the architect of the responsibility to protect doctrine in early years of the 21st century, but the responsibility to prevent the first constituent of the responsibility to protect a doctrine is actually set forth in the Genocide Convention itself. It is a convention on the prevention as well as the punishment of genocide. And regrettably, it is that dynamic, that danger of prevention uh, that we have not addressed uh, or uh, redressed. There has been, however, uh, with respect uh, to uh, Darfur, there has been uh, one important step in the face of international justice that has, in fact, uh, been taken. I'm referring to the recent decision by the International uh, Criminal Court to issue an arrest warrant for President al-Bashir of Sudan. This is indeed a historic uh, judgment. Never before has an international uh, legal institution so clearly expressed itself in the principle that nobody stands above the law. Never before has the court intervened to bring to justice, the International Criminal Court, to bring to justice a head of state in a country that is besieged by destruction and impunity with the purpose of not only putting an end to the injustice, but putting an end to the human suffering. Even so, while acknowledging that uh, the events of the surrounding the decision of the International uh, Criminal Court were nothing short of historic, there remains a cloud of impunity that still hovers above it. For it's not yet clear what judgment history will pass on the issuance of the arrest warrant. International human rights jurists hope that al-Bashir's arrest warrant will serve as the harbinger of a new era of accountability and perhaps even of a new era of deterrence. But this outcome is far from guaranteed. Let me give you a, an example of the case of Ahmed Haroun. Ahmed Haroun was the Minister of the Interior when the International Criminal Court issued two years ago an arrest warrant with respect to his involvement in the planning and perpetration of war crimes and crimes against uh, uh, humanity. But what happened after the arrest warrant was issued uh, against Ahmed Arun is a Orwellian case study in the culture of impunity. Not only did the Sudanese government not surrender Ahmed Arun to the International uh, Criminal Court, but in fact he was promoted to be the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs in charge of hearing human rights complaints against the very people, from the very people against whom he perpetrated his atrocities. And so the question becomes whether what will now occur with regard to al-Bashir will take the course that was taken with respect uh, to Ahmed uh, Harun, or uh, we will now finally have the international uh, community put itself on the side of justice and enforce 
uh, the arrest warrant. I say this because it is clear that the International uh, Criminal Court itself has no enforcement power. It is clear that the Sudanese government will not itself surrender President al-Bashir, even less so than the government uh, surrendered Ahmed Haroun, in fact, as I said, uh, promoted Ahmed Haroun at the time. So what is needed now is the concerted action of the international community through the UN Security Council, which, for example, referred the matter of al-Bashir to the International uh, Criminal Court to begin with. But only the UN Security Council, in concert with members of the international uh, community, can enforce this arrest warrant for the reasons uh, that I mentioned. But what we are witnessing now with regard to al-Bashir's uh, case is the, I don't know what uh, adjectival reference to say, his mocking defiance of the court's decision with a kind of vitriol that extorted, exhorted his followers to reject what he called this new colonization and claiming that the real criminals are the leaders of the Western countries. Notwithstanding the fact that if one looked back to 1998, amongst those who initially were state parties to the International uh, Criminal Court, 20 African countries were then amongst uh, the initiators of that treaty. Today, some 30 African countries are state parties uh, amongst the 107 state parties to the International Criminal Court uh, uh, Treaty. Yet, the vitriol in terms of characterizing the decision as if it were uh, somehow an adjunct of a colonial uh, expression. Relief organizations, which have been working tirelessly in Darfur to help alleviate the humanitarian crisis of which uh, I, I spoke, have themselves uh, been expelled uh, with uh, ruthless vindictiveness by President uh, al-Bashir. Uh, all this harkens back to the theme of both impunity under international law. The message that President al-Bashir is sending is clear and deliberate. As he puts it, in effect, what he intends to do is to continue to oppress the people of Darfur with the same ruthless abandon that led to the court order uh, to begin with. Faced with prosecution, what al-Bashir is doing is using his standing ability to bring horror to Darfur as his only leverage with respect to combating the arrest warrant itself. In a kind of perverse logic, he is thus telling the world that acquiescence and indulgence by the international community in his war crimes and crimes against humanity is the only way to stop those war crimes and crimes against humanity from uh, continuing. To be sure, there are steps that we in the international community can take. I mentioned the United Nations uh, Security Council, the cooperation of the African Union and, and member states. Hopefully, members of the National uh, Congress Party uh, in Sudan will themselves begin to distance uh, themselves from President uh, al-Bashir, though I suspect it would not bring them uh, to actually surrender him uh, to the court. Uh, that the peace process, which is two peace processes, both in a coma, in, in effect, the Darfur peace process and the north-south uh, peace process, that we will move forward in tandem on both those uh, peace processes. And so the ultimate value of this arrest warrant will not be measured in the legal precedents that it is creating, however important they may be, but in the international action that it may ultimately bring about. We have an international legal system today that is not short on principles, but tragically is short on the enforcement of those principles. We have an e international legal system that aspires to protect human rights, but falls short when the violators themselves conspire against the legal system and mock it in their defiance. And nowhere is this fact more clear than in the case of Ahmadinejad's Iran's its standing violations of international law, and tragically, the deafening, deafening silence that has been precipitated. For the enduring lesson of the Holocaust 
and the genocide that follows in the Balkans, in Rwanda, in Darfur, is that these genocides occurred not simply because of the machinery of death, but because of the state-sanctioned incitement to hate and genocide. As the Supreme Court of Canada affirmed in a judgment reflected in judgments of the International uh, Criminal uh, Tribunals, and I cite from it, that the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chambers. It began, said the court, with words. These are the chilling facts of history. These, as the court put it, are the catastrophic effects of racism. Now, with respect to the Holocaust, and more recently, with respect to the Balkans, Rwanda, Darfur, there's nothing we can do about those genocides that tragically could have been uh, prevented. Only in the case of Ahmadinejad's Iran can we still act to prevent the genocide foretold from occurring. And why do I say a genocide foretold? Because we are witnessing today in Ahmadinejad's uh, Iran, and I want to say when I use that term, and perhaps I should have said this earlier, I'm using it metaphorically speaking in two levels. Number one, I want to distinguish it from the people and the publics of Iran who themselves otherwise the objects of massive domestic repression. And when I'm referring to Ahmadinejad's Iran, I'm not referring only to President Ahmadinejad. I'm referring to the entire uh, elite of which he is a part and not even itself the supreme leader. That particular distinction uh, belongs to the supreme Ayatollah uh, Ali uh, Khamenei. So it is in that context that I am using the term. And what we find today in Ahmadinejad's Iran is the toxic convergence of the advocacy of the most horrific of crimes, namely genocide, embedded in the most virulent of hatreds, namely anti-Semitism. And I have to tell you that is not a term that I use idly or easily. Similarly, with regard to genocide, I regard that as a term that one should even shudder uh, with respect uh, to uh, its use, and which is dramatized by the parading in the streets of Tehran by putting up on uh, billboards and buses the statement, wipe Israel off the map, which uh, you have uh, read about, but perhaps not the other four words that often accompany it, which are, as the imam says, namely that this tragically is a religiously sanctioned obligation, as it were, with respect uh, to this incitement uh, to genocide. And so, the Shihab 3 missile draped in the emblem, wipe Israel off the map, uh, is paraded in the streets of Tehran while the assembled thousands are exhorted with chants of death uh, to Israel and death to Zionism. Moreover, Ahmadinejad's Iran is increasingly resorting to what can only be called incendiary and demonizing language, using epidemiological metaphors reminiscent of Nazi incitement. Let me be very clear here. I never make analogies to the Holocaust. I regard the question of the Holocaust as a unique horror. I am making only analogies in the sense of the use of epidemiological metaphors and its demonizing, dehumanizing character are themselves reminiscent of the same kind of dehumanizing metaphors uh, used at that time. For example, President Ahmadinejad and other senior officials in the Iranian government characterize Israel as, and I'm, I'm sorry for having to even use these words uh, and even to burden sensibilities uh, with the reference to them, as a filthy germ, as a stain of disgrace, as a stinking corpse, and these are only some of the metaphors used, while referring to Israelis as the true manifestations of Satan, bloodthirsty barbarians, the whole, in effect, is prologue to and justification for a Middle East genocide, while at the same time denying uh, the uh, Holocaust itself. Indeed, much of what I'm going to be saying this evening, and uh, to that to which I've already referenced, was repeated just 10 days ago by both uh, President Ahmadinejad and the 
uh, supreme religious leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and it passed almost without comment. The most extensive dehumanizing and demonic language that was used in terms of state-sanctioned culture of hate was not even commented upon uh, in the international media. It is as if we are not only no longer outraged, but as uh, John Witte was sharing with me when we were discussing this evening, as if we are in fact numbed and beyond uh, outrage. But one can talk about the banalisation in this sense, you know, of, of language, incitement, and the like. Moreover, the calls by the most senior figures in the Iranian leadership for the destruction of Israel are also frighteningly reminiscent of calls for the Rwandan extermination of the Tutsis uh, by the Hutu leadership. The crucial difference, but it is a singularly important difference, is that the Hutus were equipped with machetes, while Iran, in defiance of the world community, continues its pursuit of the most destructive of weaponry nuclear arms. Iran has also succeeded in developing and testing a long-range military a long-range missile delivery system for that purpose, which former uh, President Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani said, and I'm quoting from his remarks, could eliminate Israel in one single storm. What's interesting about what is happening uh, with respect to the way the international uh, community reacts uh, to what is taking place in Iran is that there has been and continues to be reference to the nuclear threat. And whenever there is reference to the nuclear threat, you have the response by the uh, Iranian leadership, in that sense a legitimate response on its face, uh, wherein they say, why should we not have the same right as any other state in the international uh, community to develop the civil uses, the peaceful uses of atomic energy? And they say you can't find uh, evidence for the fact, conclusive evidence, that we are indeed seeking to develop atomic weapons for ulterior purposes. If you look only with respect to the nuclear context, there's some basis for what they say, though there is, of course, three UN Security Council resolutions which have been adopted because of what, in fact, has been able to have been uh, discovered, discovered with respect uh, to their defiance of the international community. But with regard to the kind of danger from the nuclear system, you find it only when you look at the genocidal context. That's when they talk not only about incitement to genocide, but that's when they speak of using one bomb to accomplish it. So you have to go to the documentary evidence regarding incitement to genocide in order to appreciate the toxic convergence of the genocidal with the nuclear. And one of the unfortunate dynamics that has developed in the international community is I read, as you read, uh, day after day, and I think I even saw it uh, uh, in the Atlanta Constitution, an, an, an article as well, which focuses on the concern respecting the nuclear, a legitimate one, but in its complete ignoring of the genocidal, almost sanitizes the genocidal by comparison. And so we can have two fulsome, inciting speeches 10 days ago and it passes without comment. In the face of this hateful and inciting context, which has not only been fostered, but indeed created by Ahmadinejad's Iran, the international community has responded, as I've mentioned, not only with silence, but a silence that borders on active acquiescence. That President Ahmadinejad is invited to address the United Nations General Assembly, giving him an international stage to further his message of hatred is, I would say, a, mockers, a mockery of history, of law, and indeed of the UN itself. The precedents of the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda, for former Yugoslavia, the judgments of the Supreme Court of Canada ought to be applied. An individual who incites to genocide, who pursues the most destructive of weaponry in violation of the UN's own Security Council resolutions, who is complicit in crimes against humanity through genocidal terrorist proxies. And let there be no mistake about it. When we speak of Hamas and Hezbollah, we're not only talking about 
terrorist groups, so that would be bad enough. We're talking about groups that by their own assertion, not because I seek and would not wish to seek to attribute it to them, but groups who by their own covenants and platforms speak in terms of an objective that is genocidal, an ideology that is anti-Semitic, an instrumentality that is terrorist, and a reach that is global. One only has to read the Hamas Charter, which begins that the objective of, and this is, in, in a sense, the subversion of, of uh, Islam, and who better has written about it, taught this to us, uh, about the greatness of the uh, religion of Islam, which gets subverted by these things, when a Hamas charter can begin that the objective of Islam is the uh, obliter obliteration of the state of Israel. That's the kind of uh, demonizing and, and dangerous uh, language that we are finding in these uh, terrorist uh, proxies. And where Ahmadinejad warns Muslims who, if they support Israel, they will, quote, burn in the Ummah of Islam. Yet again, an undermining of the whole fabric and foundation of what Islam stands for. I recall recently uh, when I was speaking and I spoke of the fact that you could find in both the Talmud and, and in uh, the Quran and you would find as well in Christianity, you know, the notion that if you save a single person, you will always hear Jews say this and they'll quote the Talmud, if you save a single person, it is as if you have saved an entire universe. It's true, it's also there in the uh, Quran. There are commonalities that it behooves us to know about. Just as if you kill a single person, it is as if you have killed an entire uh, universe. And so you have uh, this uh, Ahmadinejad doing all this, as I've mentioned, while engaging as well in a massive repression of human rights in Iran. We just heard testimony before our Parliamentary Foreign Affairs Committee on Human Rights with regard to what is happening uh, to the Baha'is uh, in uh, Iran, a, a religious minority where uh, their seven leaders, uh, religious leaders, have all been uh, charged with espionage in relationship uh, uh, to Israel, and where in the witness testimony as appeared uh, before us uh, just uh, two weeks ago, it was replete with respect to the now domestic incitement against the Baha'i uh, community in uh, Iran itself. And so I would sum it up by saying that Ahmadinejad, Ahmadinejad's Iran and Ahmadinejad himself must be brought to account rather than being invited to a podium at the United Nations General Assembly. That only makes a mockery of the UN Charter, of international law, and of our struggle for human rights. The failure to stop past genocides, as in the unspeakable, preventable genocide of Rwanda, caused the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to lament in 2004 on the 10th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide as follows, and I quote, we must never forget our collective failure to protect at least 800,000 defenseless men, women, and children who perished in Rwanda 10 years ago, and he added, such crimes cannot be reversed. Such failures cannot be repaired. The dead, as he put it tragically, cannot be brought back to life. So, and the plaintiff plea and question, so what is it that we can do? The answer is for the international community to pay heed to the precursors of genocide in Ahmadinejad's Iran and to fulfill its responsibilities under international law. For what is so often ignored, or surprisingly, as I've learned, is not even known, is that state parties to the Genocide Convention, like the United States, like my own country, Canada, have an obligation to prevent genocide. That the direct and public incitement to genocide is prohibited, expressly prohibited, under Article 3 of the Genocide Convention, just as it's prohibited under the Treaty for an International uh, Criminal Court. And the prevention of such genocide is not a policy option. It is of the highest order of legal uh, obligation. And it is a treaty, as I said, whose 60th uh, anniversary we have just commemorated and which obliges its state parties 
in clear and unambiguous language uh, to prevent genocide. And I can tell you as someone who was involved in the prosecution of Rwandans with respect to uh, incitement uh, to genocide, I can tell you that the aggregate of precursors to genocide in Ahmadinejad's uh, Iran are as threatening, if not more so, than those that existed in the Rwandan case. And so together with the support of a distinguished group of uh, international legal scholars, uh, genocide uh, experts, survivors of the uh, killing fields, we released a petition called The Danger of a Genocidal and Nuclear Iran, the Responsibility to Prevent Petition, which documents in unprecedented fashion the critical mass of evidence regarding Iran's state-sanctioned incitement to genocide and calls upon the state parties to the convention and the competent bodies of the United Nations to act to hold Iran to account. The first part of this petition documents, I believe, presents the most comprehensive and authoritative evidentiary record with regard to this incitement. The second part identifies the panoply of remedies that the United Nations and the international uh, community are obliged uh, to take. In a matter of evidence, the petition documents the seven precursors to genocide before it seeks to demonstrate how these precursors have been transformed and congealed in Ahmadinejad's Iran into direct genocidal incitement. Our petition sets forth this documentary uh, record in full and complete uh, detail and evidentiary uh, sources and the like. I'm only going to very briefly identify uh, the seven uh, precursors, this, just so that you can get a sense of the aggregate of precursors to, uh, <coughs> precursors to incitement to genocide or to genocide in Ahmadinejad's Iran, which have almost no parallel or precedent in any of the cases of genocide that tragically have already occurred. And that's why we speak of this as a genocide foretold. The first is the precursor of delegitimization. In other words, genocide is clearly a crime almost unfathomable in its cruelty and in its scale. It would be impossible to perpetrate such a crime against those victims that would appear uh, to the genocidaire that would appear to be human. As genocide scholar Helen Fine has noted, potential victims must be seen and must be made to be seen in the minds of the genocidaire as beyond, quote, the boundaries of the universe of obligation. And the first step, therefore, is to classify the other, the targeted state and its people, as illegitimate and as unworthy of being included in the universe of obligation. This delegitimating paradigm finds expression in the rhetoric which treats uh, Israel as a foreign and alien entity that has no rightful place in the Middle East. And perhaps I should pause to say something that I might have uh, perhaps even stated at the beginning. Sometimes I feel uh, it need not be stated uh, because it has no uh, discernible connection, but needs to be stated because of some adverse inferences that could be drawn from my remarks, and it's as follows. And it is this, that Israel, like any other state, must be held responsible for any violations of human rights and humanitarian law. The Jewish people are not entitled to any privilege or preference before the international bar of humankind because of the Holocaust or human suffering. But I'm not speaking about a critique, even a rigorous critique, of any Israeli policy or practice or set of practices. As I said, Israel, like any other state, can be uh, engaged in a legitimate critique. But what we're seeing here, and under this first rubric of and dynamic of the precursors, is that in front of the United Nations General Assembly, President Ahmadinejad labels Israel as a, and I'm quoting, a criminal regime, a forged regime of murderers that evade, invade and assassinate uh, the whole, uh, a regime created on this uh, assassination of other people's land by displacing, detaining, and killing the true orders of that land. But more importantly, this exclusionary, delegitimating rhetoric finds expression in the words of the supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, 
the real leader of uh, Iran, to whom uh, Ahmadinejad always references his remarks as emanating and anchored in the words and the wisdom of the true leader of Iran. And let me read to you what the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has said. And I'm talking now only about the first, the first precursor of uh, genocide. And the quote, what are you? A forged government and a false nation. They gathered wicked people from all over the world and made something called the Israeli nation. Is that a nation? All the malevolent and evil Jews have gathered there. Because it's sometimes they say it's only referring to Zionists, it doesn't refer to Jews as if it's okay if it refers to the killing of the Zionists uh, as long as it doesn't refer to the killing of the Jews. But it's clear in Ali Khamenei's statement that it's referring here to the Jews as a people, to the Jews of the nation. It goes on to say, those Jews who went to Israel were malevolent, evil, greedy, thieves, and murderers, which brings me to the second precursor, dehumanization. Against this context and this backdrop to which I refer to the singling out and delegitimization of the alien, other, Israel, and Jewish nation, the next genocidal precursor is the dehumanization of Israelis and Jews through the use of those epidemiological metaphors, as I mentioned, that reminiscent of Nazi incitement. Indeed, in the genocide fostering process, biological euphemisms, it has to be appreciated, are not just rhetorical tools, as odious as they may be. They seek to preclude the intended victims from even being considered human to begin with. Therefore, just as Jews were labeled vermin by the Nazis and the Tutsis were labeled as cockroaches in Rwanda, so too have Israelis and Jews been dehumanized and labeled in Iran as a filthy germ, a savage beast, a cancerous tumor, a stain of disgrace on the garment of the world of Islam, a stinking corpse, a, corpse, a cancerous bacterium like cattle, nay, more misguided, a rotten dry tree, an unclean regime, I can go on, you'll get regrettably, tragically, uh, the <coughs> dehumanizing dynamic here, which brings me to the third one, demonization. Related to the dehumanization process is the demonizing process. Under this paradigm, the would-be victims of genocide are portrayed as inspirations of the devil. So what you have is dehumanization, coupled now with demonization, accomplishes the dual purpose of making the would-be victim appear not only to be less than human, or more perhaps appropriately, to appear subhuman, but also to appear to be more threatening as a kind of uh, satanic uh, evil, thereby providing a warrant uh, for genocide. Indeed, the demonization of Israel and Jews is frequent in Ahmadinejad's uh, Iran. And I don't want to go through the, uh, again, source materials here. You can assume that they are comprehensive and replete and sourced from the original uh, you know, Iranian uh, sources themselves, where Israel is accused as, and Jews are accused of, of being uh, themselves you know, almost crimes against uh, humanity. Uh, and very recently, in, as part of this uh, demonic uh, paradigm uh, where different adjectives and metaphors are used, recently Israel has been referred to as, quote, the epitome of perversion. In fact, what has been happening is rather than the uh, incitement to genocide, incendiary and inflammatory rhetoric abating, it actually has been intensified. And so it is as if the indifference, if not seeming acquiescence by the international community, almost invites you know, an escalation of the incendiary and inflammatory uh, character. <clears throat> there goes on a statement that refers uh, to uh, Israel and the Jews as the enemy of Islam, bringing me now to a fourth precursor, that if the three above precursors uh, <clears throat> of genocide, delegitimization, dehumanization, and demonization that act as prologue and justification for a Mideast genocide are not enough. President Ahmadinejad's vocabulary of hate also denies the Nazi genocide while it incites to a new one. In fact, Holocaust den denial has emerged as a particularly compelling uh, instrument as part of uh, the patterns of uh, delegitimization uh, and demonization of Israel and the Jews. 
The fifth is the false accusation in the mirror as another warrant for genocide. Holocaust denial in Iran with its inherent conspiracy theory uh, fits neatly with the false paradigm of what genocide experts have called the accusation in the mirror principle. Simply put, genocidaire will invoke this strategy to convince the audience that if the diabolical and murderous subhuman other is not attacked, then the audience will fall victim to this other, thus casting their own aggression as a mode of self-defense to protect itself against this diabolical uh, other. Again, a, a, a kind of heinous uh, form of, uh, as it's called, accusation in the mirror, a leaked motif that was used and abused by the Nazis, as well as the genocidaires in the Balkans, Rwanda, and Darfur. And again, I'm saying all this because all these leaked motifs used elsewhere resulted in the killing fields, resulted in the genocide having occurred. Only with regard to Ahmadinejad's Iran are we still in the stage of a genocide foretold where we can still, however, bring them to account. And let there be no mistake about it. Iran has already committed the crime of incitement to genocide under the Genocide Convention. It has already violated the direct the prohibition against the direct and public incitement to genocide. It's the obligation to prevent that has not been uh, brought into uh, uh, being. And again, here, uh, with respect to the uh, accusation in the mirror, references are made to the Zionist regime as a permanent threat, that Israelis kill women and children, young and old, and behind closed doors they make plans for the advancement of their evil uh, goals. And so we move almost inexorably into the protocols of the elders of Zion uh, rhetoric, uh, which found expression as it did at the podium of the United Nations General Assembly, replete in Ahmadinejad's last speech in September 2008. And then you have, just to give you the sense in which these how widespread this is. It's not only Ali Khamenei, it's not only Ahmadinejad, it's not only former President Rafsanjani. Let me show how the same hateful and cited narrative was advanced by Yahya Rahim Safavi, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards commander, and I quote, there, there is a need to topple this phony Zionist regime, this cancerous growth called Israel, which was founded in order to plunder the Muslims' resources and wealth. Again, the accusation uh, in uh, the mirror. Accuse them of being diabolic, and that's the next one, which I won't even uh, go into. Uh, satanic Jews as enemies of uh, humanity. The whole notion here is that if you can portray them not only as being diabolical, as being satanic, as being subhuman, but that they are coming to get you, and therefore the Iranian government must move first uh, to kill, lest they be killed, you get this accusation in the mirror uh, phenomenon. And finally, you have anti-Semitism itself as prologue and justification for genocide. And here too, uh, we have been down this road before. In other words, in addition to copying the genocidal incitement plan that characterized the mass murders in Rwanda, the Balkans, and Sudan, the current Iranian regime is also relying on one of the most enduring and heinous of hatreds, namely that of anti-Semitism. For all its sophistication and euphemism, the dehumanization and demonization of Jews and Israelis in contemporary Iran is no different than the classical anti-Semitic discourse that has reared its ugly head for thousands of, of years. And again, the paper and the petition uh, go into this in extensive uh, detail, uh, but I won't uh, go into it uh, here other than to mention uh, one particular uh, group libel uh, that calls upon you know, classic uh, anti-Semitic tropes in its characterization. In other words, uh, Iranian presidential advisor, again, I'm just using different sources, Ali Ramin, has resurrected the historic uh, falsehood, the group libel calumny of dirty Jews poisoning Christian wells, a pernicious and demonizing myth, as, as you know, was used uh, to fuel anti-Semitism in the Middle Ages and beyond. And here I quote this statement. But among the Jews, there have always been those who killed God's prophets and who opposed 
justice, and righteousness. Throughout history, this religious group has inflicted the most damage on the human race, while some groups within it engage in plotting against other nations and ethnic groups to cause cruelty, malice, and wickedness. Historically, there are many accusations against the Jews. For example, it was said that they were the source for such deadly diseases as the plague and typhus. This is because the Jews are very filthy people. For a time, people also said that they poisoned water wells belonging to Christians and thus killed them. Now, the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, has combined these two images of Jews conspiring against the world and Jews waging covert war on a people in elaborating to his audience what he called the satanic design of this people and of this uh, state. And again here, a series of uh, quotes, uh, and I won't reference them here, but you already have appreciated, I think, the nature of this state-sanctioned incitement to genocide, which uh, Iran has channeled into a call for the genocide itself without any sense of even euphemism or uh, ambiguity. And this you find in the ongoing parading in the streets of Tehran, as I mentioned, of a Shiab three missile draped in the emblem, wipe Israel off the map, as the Imam says. Of the same placards with these references up on uh, billboards on military headquarters uh, and the like, the same kind of public referencing and direct and public uh, incitement. In his uh, call for annihilation, President Ahmadinejad recently, we're talking, referenced the former, as I mentioned, Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. And, and this is done often where he incorporates the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini both uh, for purposes of anchoring himself in the Supreme Leader's remarks and giving uh, those uh, remarks an authoritative and religious compelability that uh, perhaps even Ahmadinejad might feel they would not otherwise have without the imprimatur of the Supreme Leader. And so on June 2nd, 2008, speaking at the shrine where the uh, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, as distinct from the Supreme Leader now, Ali Khamenei, we're not talking about the uh, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, where he is buried, President Ahmadinejad repeated as follows, Ayatollah Khomeini's ideal is about to be materialized today. The Zionist regime is in a total dead end, and God willing, this desire will soon be realized, and this epitome of perversion will disappear off the face of the world. Uh, statement after statement, uh, the region and the world are being prepared for great changes and for being cleansed of this satanic uh, enemy. Uh, and it goes on and on in this same vein. As I say, it's not just uh, Ahmadinejad saying him, it's not just the reference back to the then Supreme uh, Leader Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, but also the now Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, and I'll close with some of his statements, and I quote, this is now the Supreme Leader speaking, not only once, repeatedly, not only privately, uh, uh, publicly, not only resonating uh, within Iran, but being uh, transmitted through electronic uh, media throughout uh, the uh, Muslim world as follows, and I quote, it is the mission of the Islamic Republic of Iran to erase Israel from the map of the region. Again, Iran's stance has always been clear on this ugly phenomenon called Israel. We have repeatedly said that this cancerous tumor of a state should be removed from the region. As I said, this is not without youth, not with even the euphemisms of the cockroaches of Rwanda in reference to the Tutsis. This is a direct and clear and unequivocal uh, reference to whom this cancerous tumor is. Again, there is only one solution. Here's, I, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei recently saying, there's only one solution to the Middle East problem, namely the annihilation and destruction of the Jewish state. Clear, unambiguous, unequivocal, and goes on uh, in this uh, re regard. Similar statements that were made even uh, during the uh, israel Hezbollah war in 2006 uh, with regard uh, to Hezbollah as its uh, Iranian proxy and the like. Which brings me now, and I'll move very quickly to a close, to the legal uh, recourses. Because the second part of the petition sets forth a number of recourses that the United Nations, its agencies, and members of the international community have an obligation 
have a responsibility uh, to pursue. And I might add that one of the signatories uh, to our uh, petition, I might add as well that John Woody Jr. is a signatory to this petition, one of them is uh, Louise Arbour, the former uh, United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, who writes in our petition to the effect that the prevention, the prevention of incitement to genocide is an overarching legal obligation. It's a matter of use kogans of the highest uh, legal uh, order in terms of undertaking and implementing this legal obligation. So how do we, in fact, implement it? How do we exercise the responsibility uh, to uh, prevent? The first would be, and it is mandated by Article 8 of the Genocide Convention, is for state parties to the international community to take the modest step, the simply modest step of just referring, just referring this criminal incitement to the United Nations General Assembly or to any of the United Nations uh, agencies uh, for uh, discussion and perspective and accountability. Yet as I'm speaking to you, not one state party in the international community has taken the modest step and indeed obligation to just refer to the United Nations uh, Security Council. A second uh, remedy that is not only available but mandatory and that is state parties to the Genocide Convention can, indeed I would argue, are obliged to initiate an interstate complaint against Iran, which is also a state party to the Genocide Convention, let it not be forgotten, before the International Court of Justice, again as authorized by the Genocide Convention. A third, that Ahmadinejad and other designated Iranian leaders should be placed on a watch list by concerned countries preventing their entrance as inadmissible uh, persons. I've argued elsewhere that given United States anti-terrorist law, Ahmadinejad could be considered an inadmissible person uh, to the uh, United States. There are those who argue, well, uh, yes, but uh, the United States agreement with the United Nations and the headquarters agreement obliges the United uh, States to in fact admit Ahmadinejad to attend uh, the United Nations General Assembly. I've written elsewhere that not only is this not obligatory on the part of the United States, but that the opposite is, is obligatory, namely not uh, to give him a podium, to hold him to account, and if you want a precedent with respect to a head of state not being admitted to the United States in order to be able to attend the United Nations General Assembly, it occurred with Austrian President Kurt Waldheim at the time that he was a, a president. So the, the precedent exists and the principle and obligation here is overriding. The United States should call upon UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He has authority under Article 99 of the UN Charter to refer a threat of, to international peace and security to the UN Security uh, Council uh, for discussion and debate. Has that yet been done? Not at all. Has Ban Ki-moon been called upon to do it? As far as I know, not at all uh, as, as well. In Canada, I will be presenting shortly a private member's bill called the Iran Accountability Act that seeks to implement these remedies and more. It will seek to establish a monitoring uh, mechanism to track incitement to hate and incitement to genocide in Ahmadinejad's Iran, and it would seek to s attach sanctions not only with respect to uh, Iran's nuclear uh, program, but to attach sanctions with respect to its uh, genocidal incitement. Why is it that we are attaching sanctions to the nuclear program, which we should, even though the conclusive evidence with respect to its purported uh, uh, use is not necessarily there, but we don't attach any sanctions with respect to genocidal incitement where the evidence is comprehensive and conclusive and compelling, and by not attaching sanctions to the genocidal, we both sanitize the genocidal and indeed undermine the case uh, as it happens uh, inadvertently for the nuclear. For state sanctioned incitement to genocide is a singular and unique threat to international peace and security. While over 60 years have passed since the international community sought to address it by prohibiting expressly genocidal incitement, this juridical uh, response absent tangible evidence and action to enforce it has proven manifestly inadequate. We continue to be haunted and should be by the preventable genocides in Rwanda, in former uh, Yugoslavia, while our collective failure to end the genocide in Darfur 
results in lives continuing to be lost on a daily basis. Meanwhile, Ahmadinejad's Iran has emerged as the world's first realistic threat, albeit a nascent one, in terms of the convergence, the toxic convergence of the genocidal and uh, the nuclear. As I've mentioned, the legal apparatus for effectively preventing genocide, for implementing our responsibility to prevent, for giving expression and implementation to the remedies mandated by the Genocide uh, Convention exists. What remains is for the action uh, to be taken on the basis of the principles which we have set forth uh, this evening. As we've learned all too well, the cost of ignoring the responsibility to prevent is incalculable. We do not need another kind of tragic lament as we had with regard to Kofi Annan and what happened in Rwanda. We established this national day of reflection on the prevention of genocide to learn the lessons of Rwanda, just as we have to learn the lessons of these last 60 years with which I began and with which I close. Lesson number one, the danger of state-sanctioned incitement to genocide. Lesson number two, the danger of indifference and inaction in the face of this genocidal incitement. Lesson number three, the danger of a, cultural, of a culture of impunity. And so we must say no to a genocidal Iran, no to a nuclear Iran, no to a rights-violating Iran, but yes, yes always to the responsibility to prevent. And the time to act is now. Thank you. I'm a regular Talmud studier, and uh, the Talmud, you know, is full of questions. Questions, questions, questions. And the most interesting of these statistics is the average length of a question in the Talmud is a mere seven words. Um, there's a natural tendency of people to ask interminable questions, um, and it's more important to get lengthy answers than um, long questions. So. Uh, even those of you who are not regular Talmud studiers perhaps could uh, learn the lesson to ask concise questions so we can all benefit from lengthy answers. Please. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your speech, and um, I want to um, congratulate you on all the work that you've done. Why should we put any faith in the international community to do anything of this, especially since probably a majority of the members w would not be offended if Iran carried out its genocidal um, um, intentions. I, I think the, uh, the, the issue here, um, I understand uh, the skepticism with regard to trying to put one's faith in the international uh, community. I have spoken elsewhere and could well have spoken uh, this evening uh, about the fact that the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council that replaced what finally became the discredited predecessor United Nations Human Rights Commission which uh, law professors would refer to as the uh, repository of standard setting in international law. That predecessor, United Nations Human Rights Commission, singled out one member state of the international community, uh, namely Israel, for 35% of its resolutions of condemnation. It was replaced in June 2006 by the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council uh, with the hope for universal periodic uh, review and equality before the law of all states in the international arena. As we meet, the, the new United Nations uh, Human Rights Council has adopted 25 resolutions of condemnation. 20 of those resolutions, 80%, have singled out one member state of the international community, namely Israel. But worse, the major human rights violators, Iran, Sudan, China, and the like, have enjoyed exculpatory immunity. Not one. Not one resolution has been passed against any of them. So this could naturally lead you know, to your question, why place any trust in the uh, international community? And maybe it's because I'm a Canadian. I've grown up as a child of the UN. Uh, for those of us in Canada, the United Nations has always been held out, and I'm repeating the mantra 
of many governments, including myself on different occasions, that the United Nations is an organizing idiom of Canadian uh, foreign policy, that international law is a foundation of our uh, multilateralism. Uh, the struggle uh, for human rights is what we stand for as part of our identity. I'm saying here that what is at stake at this point uh, is really the integrity of the United Nations under whose protective uh, cover uh, these this singling out takes place and this exculpatory immunity takes place. What is at stake now is the integrity of international law under whose imprimatur uh, these resolutions of condemnation are being uh, adopted and the struggle for human rights under whose banner this happens. And so I'm saying with regard to what is now happening in Ahmadinejad's Iran, if we care at all about international law, if we care at all about the most uh, compelling of international treaties, the Genocide Convention, if we've learned anything of the last 60 years, if we want to show that we've learned something from these last 60 years, then we must act now. And I, I believe what, it, what is missing is moral and intellectual and diplomatic leadership and even knowledge. Let me, I know I'm, I'm taking the much longer response than uh, for your short question, but I, I'm struck by something that I you know, can't forget. Three months after I became Minister of Justice, I came down to the United States to Washington for a meeting of the G8 Ministers of Justice hosted by John Ashcroft. I looked at the agenda. There was no reference, we're talking now April 2004, to Darfur. So I said, you know, Mr. Ashcroft, I'm looking at the agenda. I don't see any reference to Darfur. He said, well, you know, the civil servants have prepared this agenda, and that's the agenda that uh, we now have. Then he paused for a moment. He said, but you know what? We, we're having an informal uh, dinner this evening before we begin tomorrow. I'll let you speak to uh, the question of Darfur. So I spoke that evening at the dinner, you know, about the Darfur. Five of the eight G8 ministers of justice came up to me afterwards and said, we didn't know anything was going on in Darfur. Why do I say this is that politicians live in a bubble? It was astonishing to me that one would find a situation where ministers of justice would ha acknowledge they knew nothing about what's happening in Darfur. I have found out that most people don't know about the genocidal incitement in Ahmadinejad's Iran. It's much more difficult for them to turn a blind eye to it when they are told about it and called upon to do something than if they are uh, able to luxuriate uh, in their ignorance. That's the reason that we uh, drew up this petition and drew up now a campaign to go to 13 countries which have a nexus in one form or another to Ahmadinejad's Iran, to the international community, and call upon one of them at least to start the process of, in fact, holding Ahmadinejad's Iran to account. Will it work? I don't know. But I remember my late colleague, uh, John Humphrey, who, one of the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, who was talking about how do you bring human rights violators to account. Uh, he said, you know, uh, you have to mobilize shame against uh, the human rights uh, violators. I've learned that you also have to mobilize shame against those who are indifferent uh, to the uh, human rights violations, including in particular genocidal incitement. As Martin Luther King, and maybe being in Atlanta, I'm reminded of this one, he said that uh, one, ha yet one has to guard oneself not only against the acts of one's enemies, but against the silence of one's friends. And so what we're hoping to do is to break the silence of one's friends and hopefully bring about their action. Uh, Professor Cutler, you've, you've made an incredibly compelling argument and put so many facts about the incitement to genocide, but we've seen a genocide in action for six years, and that same community that you're appealing to has not been able to generate the will to intercede before. Um, if you think that we can get the world community to intercede before something happens, just in the incitement stage, what makes you 
feel that could be true when a genocide is taking place today as we speak and the human and the uh, humanitarian agencies are being sent away from Darfur and the world is still silent the the actual vehicle the United Nations has been unable to intercede please give me some hope that you're going to be able to convince through your petition where the past six years we haven't been able to convince no I, I don't I think that uh, the petition will do it. Uh, certainly the petition alone, it's just one uh, small uh, ripple in the uh, case uh, that needs uh, to be made uh, domestically and internationally. I, I, I want to say that I do uh, hope uh, that President Obama will take the moral lead here. I say this because he himself has spoken uh, about the genocidal threat. He has spoken about uh, Iran and its terrorist proxies, and he has spoken about the nuclear threat. I would hope that the fact that he has at least acknowledged uh, the kind of toxic combination here uh, might move him uh, to act. My, I've also been intrigued, you know, just watching it from Canada, that thus far many of his decisions in disparate areas have had what I call a rule of law idiom about it. Uh, you know, his first decision, you know, to close down uh, Guantanamo Bay, uh, to uh, ban uh, torture, uh, to remove more recently the reference to uh, enemy combatants, to begin to alter the whole approach of the struggle, uh, anti-terrorism law and, and policy. Uh, I'll bespeak, you know, a, an appreciation of the importance of the rule of law. Uh, while Canada was concerned, and rightly so, with the protectionist impulses uh, that were beginning to uh, <coughs> manifest themselves in the U.S. Uh, Congress, um, it was uh, President Obama said, look, protectionism would run afoul of the World Trade Organizations and that whole uh, international legal uh, trade regime and the like. And I can go on. My hope is that somebody like Obama with an appreciation of the evidence as a former law professor, now President of the United States, and realizing uh, the compelability to act lest on his watch what took place on previous President's watches doesn't take place, will be moved uh, to act. I, there has been, uh, and now with regard to Dar Darfur, uh, <coughs> bless you, there, there are several initiatives that, that can be taken. I, I, in Canada, you know, put out ad nauseum what I call the 10-point uh, action plan uh, to the ongoing silence of the international community. Uh, the most modest uh, recommendation I made was that what we needed was what I called a Darfur summit, that all the uh, interlocutors that are engaged with respect uh, to Darfur, the African Union, uh, the United Nations, uh, the Arab uh, League, <coughs> and uh, and so on, should come together and adopt an action plan. What that action plan needs to be does not admit of any doubt. What is absent is any action on that action plan. Now, I've heard and uh, that there has been some talk in the United States that maybe, maybe the U.S. government will, alone will begin to enforce U.N. Security Council resolutions with regard to D Darfur. It would be much better if the international community enforced them, but I don't hold much hope in them. But there are things that the United States uh, can do that would send a message. For example, it can put an end, uh, even temporarily, to the communication system in, in, in Sudan. Just jam the cell phones, jam the telecommunication system. It can start to interdict uh, you know, the export of, of oil uh, from uh, Sudan, where in, in, in fact it is the revenues from that oil uh, that are used uh, for purposes of buying uh, the weapons that are then used to kill Darfuris. We can seek to leverage uh, China, uh, which is more an enabler than an enforcer of international law. There are a number of things which I, I think can be done. I have not yet seen, uh, and even, if you will, to enforce the no-fly zone uh, by bombing an airfield, if need be, in Sudan, uh, so that the planes can't go up and engage in their indiscriminate bombing of uh, civilian uh, villages. I really think we have to start to be tough when we are talking about 
genocide. And the international community has to act. If it does not act, uh, it will encourage the continuation of not only these crimes, but the impunity that attends them because they see the indifference and inaction on the part of the international community. So I have to say to you that um, I'm very much looking towards a moral, diplomatic, uh, juridical, and even military leadership by the United States in concert with the international community, but if necessary, if because we are dealing with genocide, doing what is necessary to stop it. I think you've made a compelling case for, from my perspective that uh, Iran is uh, inciting and uh, legitimating an attack on and destruction of the state of Israel. And obviously that implies killing as many Israelis as necessary to accomplish the objective. So I'm asking a narrow question. Is that sort of attack equivalent to an incitement to genocide or do you need something more to prove genocide under applicable treaties? Well, I, I think that, as I said, that the, the genocide convention has already been violated, that the prohibition against incitement to genocide has already uh, been violated, that Iran has committed uh, this crime of incitement to genocide. And we should not even uh, think about uh, starting to go down the road to the actual commission of acts of, of genocide, such as using uh, nuclear weapons and the like. That is why I say that the responsibility uh, to prevent uh, is now, and it is urgent, and it is uh, necessary. You know, when uh, we read about Israel saying that, and at one point President Obama said this as well, that no option should be taken off the table, i.e. A, a preemptive military strike with regard uh, to uh, Iran. Let me say, lest the question either be asked or some of you may wonder what I believe about that, I'm against a preemptive military strike. Uh, this may sound to some as putting undue faith in not only in uh, the international community, but maybe in President Obama's uh, diplomacy and, and the like. I, my, it's all my own, you know, uh, instinctive behavior is against a, a military strike. I'm not even sure that a military strike would work, and I'm worried about what would what it would set off. But I would like to think that uh, the United States could, uh, as I say, in concert with the international community, act now on the genocide on seven. The remedies here are very modest. What is so tragic is that none of them have been uh, initiated. And I would, I would hope that uh, if a presidential leader uh, wants to act in accordance with a rule of law norm, then the action to take is to invoke and apply the rule of law. There's no higher law than the Genocide Convention, and there's no greater crime uh, than genocide, and there is no more dangerous threat than the crime that has already been committed, uh, namely the incitement. The genocide. The evidence is there. What it now takes is for uh, a state party like the United States to lead the way in acting. When President Obama, and I'll close on this point, has said that he wants to engage Iran, um, I have said elsewhere that I support engagement with uh, Iran if that will bring about the objective which we seek. When he says more specifically that it will be a policy of engagement with uh, sticks and carrots, that I'm saying there is here a legal stick, an effective use of what some have called, you know, uh, soft legal power, but which if used can be effective and accomplish its objective. Uh, to have engagement which would sanitize genocide and make no reference uh, to it, and where Iran could then continue the genocidal incitement with impunity because we would focus only on the enriched uranium, uh, I think would be a mistake and would actually encourage the incitement rather than prevent it. So unless we see signs 
that Iran is going to be engaged on the issue of genocidal incitement as well as on the issue of uh, processing uh, uranium to acquire uh, nuclear weapons, then that will be a kind of, of litmus test as to whether we're serious or we're not serious. And that's one of the interesting things about this whole uh, question of uh, combating uh, state sanctioned incitement to genocide. This is going to be a test of our resolve and how serious we are to do something about it or to sanitize it and then indulge a culture of impunity the way we have tragically uh, done uh, and are continuing to do with regard uh, to Darfur, let alone the tragic horror of what happened in Rwanda. Last question from the audience. Um, thank you so much for your speech. I'm a Fulbright fellow and a Kurd from northern Iraq with a Q. Uh, to 21 years from now, at this very day, on March 16th, uh, uh, in the small, tiny town of Halabja, the Iraqi regime uh, used chemical weapons against the Kurds and killed 5,000 people. And that was a, as a direct result of the uh, invasion of the city by the, Iraqi, by the Iranian army. And it appeared to me through your enlightening speech that Iran didn't divert from the genocidal uh, behavior of Saddam Hussein's regime. Actually, the reverse is true. My question is, uh, how do you see the protection of the human rights and civil and political rights of minorities in Iran, including the Baha'is and the Kurds, and for that matter, uh, uh, advocating for an independent state for the Kurds in Iran, uh, will divert Iran and the other regimes in the region from their uh, genocidal behavior. Thank you. Okay, first thing I, I, I should tell you that because we didn't move against uh, uh, the genocidal acts uh, of Iraq against uh, the Kurd, you know, 21 years ago, we found ourselves uh, in 2003 uh, moving against uh, Iraq some uh, 15 years too late. Uh, I was one of those in the Canadian Parliament actually who opposed the uh, U.S. intervention in Iraq, not because I, I held any brief for Saddam Hussein. As I say, I thought we should have held him to account uh, in 1988 and then in 1991 uh, with regard to the uh, genocidal acts in the south of Iraq. So we had it both in the north and we had it in the south. And I believe that had there been uh, sought a United Nations authorization uh, with respect to intervening in Iraq, not because of weapons of mass destruction, which I did not feel the evidence demonstrated, but because of the genocidal acts that had already been committed and the massive repression that was uh, continuing and had been put on that basis, I would have supported it, and I think there might have been a disposition in the international community to do so. And even if we could not have gotten a UN Security Council resolution with regard to Iraq, we might have gotten as we got uh, with Kosovo and NATO uh, authorization had there been uh, an, an, any uh, veto at the UN Security Council. Because we did not act then, we inherited what then happened in uh, Iraq, you know, uh, 15 years later. I believe now with regard uh, to Iran, we need uh, to encourage, you know, civil society uh, in uh, Iran. Uh, there was an excellent uh, article uh, written by Ladan Burman, an Iranian uh, dissident who heads up the Burman uh, Foundation, appeared in the Democracy Journal, I think it was in October 2007, about uh, the plight of women in, in Iran, uh, how, uh, in, in fact, Ahmadinejad's Iran was uh, targeting not only women, but the women's movement and the like, and how courageous, uh, you know, was this women's movement, which was standing up. Uh, in Iran, and, and, and she began to show in, in her article the aggregative nature now in, in this instance of civil uh, society, of women and trade unions and students and, and intellectuals and, and academics and religious uh, minorities and political minorities and the like. If you put aggregate it all together, uh, you have a powerful um, aggregate of civil society uh, groups uh, linked together by a democratic impulse and the like, but they don't have power. What they have is commitment. And I think what is important 
is that you know trade unionists here stand up for trade unionists in Iran. Women here stand up for women in Iran. Students here stand up for students in Iran, and so on. We need to create a multiplier, you know, uh, aggregative uh, parallel uh, in the United States, in Canada, etc., with regard to what is happening in Iran. That's one of the reasons that we started uh, two weeks ago, uh, before uh, the parliamentary committee on which I sit, the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Human Rights. We are holding hearings now on uh, the. Uh, genocidal, nuclear, and rights violating uh, Iran. What comes out of this evening is that we can have more voices that will speak up, more voices that will call on their Congress people and senators and on their government uh, to act and on civil society. Then we can uh, create, I hope, that uh, critical mass, that constituency of conscience that will act on the lessons of the last 60 years and where never again will not be an oft-abused cliché, but can be put into effect uh, to exercise our responsibility to prevent. Well, my friend, you certainly have broken the silence of your friends on this uh, moving and difficult and tragic issue. Um, I think you have spoken with eloquence, you've spoken with passion, you've spoken with diplomatic and jurisprudential acuity, and I think that very wimpy response that we had from the uh, audience has to now be echoed with a thunderous round of applause for Erwin Kotler. I'm standing between you and the buffet table that awaits you outside, and I have three quick things that I would like to uh, bring to your attention. Number one, uh, I hope that uh, you will come back and join us for a, a series of events uh, that will follow in these next couple of weeks, uh, beginning on Wednesday with Mona Siddiqui, who will be in this auditorium at 12 noon, and again two weeks hence on the 30th when Bishop Eugene Robinson will be here. Both of these events are described for you briefly in your program and in more detail in the materials outside. I commend those to you and I invite you back to those events. Uh, secondly, I hope that you will allow us to get to know you better and to reach you uh, more effectively in future uh, with our advertisements, our emails, and other distributions about our events. And if you could let us know by filling in this little gray form in your program, uh, letting us know how you found out about this event, uh, giving us suggestions and criticisms, and encouraging us to do other things that would be effective for you and for your constituencies and communities, uh, we would be very grateful to learn about the same. And finally, I want to thank a number of colleagues that uh, were critical to uh, the choreography of this evening and who put together uh, the events. Uh, first of all, the dream team of our Law and Religion Center, April Bogle, Linda King, uh, uh, Amy Wheeler, and Anita Mann. I think if I could ask them to stand and receive our applause of appreciation. Scott Andrews and Corky Gallo have always been working behind the scenes on our audiovisual, together with uh, Larry Wagner and Jeff Hewitt. And we also thank them, together with Stacy Harwell, Martha Kim, and Grace Kim, for all of their work in putting this together. Will you join me in a round of applause for them? And finally, a round of applause for yourself for braving the Atlanta weather, for braving the Atlanta traffic, and for joining us this evening. Will you please join us for a reception to follow and engagement with Professor Kotler and his colleague David Grossman, who is here, and who can give you further information about the petition and your opportunities to join the community of conscience that's gathered around this fundamental issue. Thank you again for this evening. Godspeed in your travels home. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.